Well, hey, Dave Melinda here, Positive Polarity Podcast. Hope things are going awesome for you this week. I got a great question because I got a great guest, and this will really um, kind of make you think a little bit, maybe more than you're prepared right now, but I want to ask you a question. If you want to learn how to transform a complex challenge into a high-impact success, then we are sitting with a legend that is going to help us through that today. I'm honored to be hanging out with John Rossman. How are you, my friend? Dave, thanks for welcoming me to the Positive Polarity Podcast. I'm doing great. Awesome. Well, hey, I tell you what, right off the bat, you are a managing partner at Rossman Partners. I want to find out what that is and get the listeners more informed. But I want to get with that question because I feel like when there's a problem or challenge, and again, all these semantics, everybody uses a different thing. Your business isn't going the way you want it to go is probably the way I think of it. I think a lot of times, John, people want to try to make that go away. They want to pretend it never happened. There's all these things that we do. I'm not seeing a lot of people that want to um, transform a challenge into a success. So when you wrote that, what were you thinking and and what did that look like for you in your life? Yeah. So um, the, the book we're referring to is a book called Big Bet Leadership. And, it, and a big bet is any situation, and they come in kind of two forms. One is a significant problem in your business. And what typically happens is, as you were saying, like, we want to treat the the simplistic symptoms of of it but when you are facing you know competition cost maybe undifferentiated value propositions in your business like the you're it's just you're always just pushing uphill right you you never have any positive gravity pulling you what sure. that is that's a signal from the market that you need to make a significant change that's a big bet. A big bet is any situation, strategy, plan that has these two attributes, has high potential for impacting your business, but it also comes with risks, unknown unknowns, and dependencies. And so the key is having both ambition, but a, a, an approach to experiment relative to these things. And that's, that's the playbook of big bet leadership. Well, hey, you you said something funny because pushing uphill, most people just push harder, right? Exactly. I, mean, it's, it's, I, it's I, I like I like gliding a little bit every once yeah. in a while, you know, having gravity work for me, you know, and everything, right? Yep. So isn't it great when your customers love you? Isn't it great when your cost for acquisition is going down? Isn't it great when you have a cost advantage relative sure. to your competition, right? Those, that's the type of, downhill skiing that I like to create in businesses. Yeah. Well, I tell you, it's way more fun in cross-country skiing going downhill than uphill. I watch those guys. Exactly. You, I'm you, like, man, you can, you can only it. do that for so long, right? And, and but but I gotta say, and I don't know if that's a blind spot or if that's just how people are, John. Most people think that you always are going uphill. And I think that there's this feeling of like I'm doing something wrong if I'm able to coast or if I'm able to not pedal so hard. So starting at that mindset spot for a second, do you yeah. run into when you coach people, when you're working with companies, do they, is that a kind of a typical feeling where, what? hey, I feel really bad if I'm not pedaling my yeah, brains out? It, 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 because the essence isn't not to work hard. The essence is to to create a business that that has viral you know growth and and again customers that love you markets that are pulling you more opportunities than you know what to do with and everything right yeah. and so it, it it to me it's not about coasting or not coasting it's about like skiing downhill but skiing faster you know and everything sure. right and and but what you do find is that people they they don't recognize those signals that are coming from the market, right? And so they just go, as you were saying, like, hey, a little more hustle, little, a little better execution, and we'll solve it. Sometimes, yeah. maybe, yeah. Is, is the answer. But oftentimes, it, it really, you need to rethink something fundamental about the product, the service, your cost structure, your organization, your customers, your go-to-market. And, and the, that slowing down 
and rethinking that. I just got off a call with with a, a, a big client, a company I know extremely well, and they they they're they've got a, ch a challenge, which is also a big opportunity in their business. And everybody just wants to spring to action. But I'll guarantee you what they're going to treat is just the symptoms of it. And they'll sure. be able to, to tell everybody like, hey, you know, we're doing this thing that is going to result. They it will not make a dent relative to this situation. And it's just putting lipstick on the pig and a transformation like the definition of a transformation is a significant change, right? It's not about incremental ism or incremental yep. changes, which are fine. But if, but if you never fundamentally think about transforming your business and innovating in your business, then you're likely missing a big opportunity. So I love that piece. Before we get into more of that, tell me how did where did Big Bet leadership come from for you? Because obviously you have a cool story which we want to unpack. I just am curious where did that come from for you? Yeah. So part of that story. So I, I was an early Amazon executive. We'll we'll talk about that. But I was um, I got to be the senior technology advisor at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I worked with them for over seven years. And that work was really impactful to me for a variety of reasons, which we can talk about. But it was the first time I heard this concept of what a big bet was. Right. And and I thought that like that that concept of of big. So it has ambition, but a bet. Well, what's a bet? A bet is something that I think is a good idea, but I don't know for sure, right? Like there's an yep, element sure. of calculated risk taking to it. And yep. and I sat on that concept for a lot of years. And then this book came from yet another client. My co-author, Kevin McCaffrey, was my client at T-Mobile. And this was kind of the playbook that we built off of all the Amazon mechanisms that I had written about so much to sure. create really a leadership framework for how to think through these transformational opportunities. Well, and so you use a word that I think people are, they, they, they cringe and it's risk. You know, I mean, let's be real. We're business owners. The less risk we take, the more comfortable we feel. But then obviously the less success we generally have. When you think about a big bet, a big bet to you, John, might be completely different than a big bet to me, right? So I kind of want to just share with the group listening that, hey, you your big bet might be way different than, than your neighbors. And do you run into people oh, like yeah. having, you know, nervous about what that means? Well, um, y yes. And we could go a long way with this, this question and this concept. But as you pointed out, we know like, the biggest opportunities are always calculated risk. Like that's where the alpha is. That's where that's where the opportunity is. And fundamentally, innovation is about taking something that doesn't exist today and making it exist. An entrepreneur is always taking something that doesn't exist today and creating something that 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 does exist now and sure. everything. Right. Th those are calculated risks, and that is how you outcompete the market. And that's at a company level, that's at a team level, and that's at an individual level. Even even in my small advisory business, this book and the way that we are proceeding on putting it to the market, we're we're using our own dog, we're eating our own dog food relative to how we're doing that versus what sure. most authors, you know, it it it, it would would go it's like oh a big yeah. marketing spend and plan like no we're doing a bunch of calibrated things sure. learning what resonates in the market and at the right point we'll strike a, a bit bigger and everything relative to that so again this playbook is useful at a big company at a small company at a team and at an individual level to think through what could be and how do i experiment on it because the dangerous thing about these big these these situations is, I mean, there's a couple of ways that failure happen, but one of the typical patterns is we fall in love with the idea and then we just go all in. But there's <laughs> there's always nuancing and learning and testing that needs to be done, and so just resist that temptation, slow it down, 
think it through and figure out how do I test this along the way and communicate and lead all the participants that need to participate in this. And that's, again, the story of Big Bet Leadership. Sure. And it seems counterproductive because to me, a big bet means I drop a big bunch of money on a table and I got one chance at this, right? I mean, it's either going to be and, and, and that green is, or blue is, or black or red or whatever, right? Right. And that, um, you know, the title does infer that, but the, the, the fourth chapter is called Think Big But Bet Small. And so the 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 play of the words in big bet is the big is the ambition that's actually not the size of the bet and the gotcha. whole mantra of the book is how to seize upside opportunity while de-risking the 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 fundamental risk based aspect of this concept so that by the time we're actually going big it's no longer a bet. It's just a good yeah. investment because you've proven out the biggest aspects that need to be proven out. Gotcha. So before we jump into your story about Amazon, I just want to share a word with somebody listening, John, that's risk averse. They're struggling to think about risk. Their company's being limited right now because they won't risk. What's like, what would you share with them to be able to encourage them to take a risk or at least consider taking a risk? I mean, I, I, I think standing still is the riskiest thing uh, to be doing. And, um, and so that's what I would say is like, you think you're being risk adverse. I would propose you are actually taking the riskiest position of all. And the, and mm. the truth lies in, well, what time frame are we thinking about here? Sure. Short term, not investing effort, not investing time, not experimenting, not not doing these things. Well, that's the safest position to take. But long term, we know if we stop learning and if we start stop testing and we stop trying to grow as a business, as a team or as an individual, well, that's actually the riskiest position to take. And so what I would frame is like, well, in what time frame are we talking about? And I would try to point out to you that cal calculated risk taking is actually the safest position to be taking. Wow. Well, I hope that that spoke to somebody because we do have a lot of people that listen that want to jump into being an entrepreneur. They want to jump into owning their own business. Maybe they just want to side hustle. They want to take that first step. And it's so hard because so few people actually do it. So Hopefully it encourages you. Again, we always say, please don't, don't, if you got kids and a family, please don't quit your job and then decide what you're going to do <laughs> unless you got tons of money. Right. But it's a, like, a, 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 amen. Uh, and as yeah. you know, I was thinking about like, cause one of our discussions would be about my journey as an entrepreneur and it's been a yeah. very calculated set of, of steps and thinking because, you know, of, of like, I couldn't go all in and um, and I didn't have the basis and I had a family and too much at stake. So it's been a very kind of set of, of steps to be, you know, a true entrepreneur uh, yeah. whilst always being entrepreneurial throughout the journey. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm sure you piqued a bunch of people's interest about Amazon. So tell us about that journey at Amazon and um, how that's helped you today. Yeah, so I was an early leader at Amazon. One of my sons says, "Dad, you were an OG at Amazon." So I, I was, I was there from early 2002 through late 2005. Um, my role, I was a key leader in the launch of the Amazon Marketplace business. So again, this is 2002. Ninety percent of Amazon's bu business was books, music, video, and this was the platform and the the strategy to create broad category selection by having other people offer it. But the complexity there, the hard, the wicked problem in this is we had a customer obsession. We wanted an, an extremely good and trusted customer experience, which was different than eBay, which was the king. eBay was three times our size at the time. So yeah. we designed a very different philosophy and approach and style of selling than than what would have been the easy and obvious thing to copy, which was eBay. So I ran that business for a few years um, and I left in late 2005 to start 
working with my clients like the Gates Foundation on making significant change happen. But I learned so much about so many things. I've written now four books that that are all fueled from those. And I was a I was a partner at Arthur Anderson before Amazon. I'm, I'm an engineer. I was a Six Sigma. Like like I went into Amazon thinking that I I was an operator and everything. And I learned so many tricks and perspectives and techniques. And it was at the Gates Foundation several years after I left Amazon that a client of I wrote one white paper um, about called Future Ready Self Service and. One of my clients at the foundation called me in and he had the piece in his hand and he goes, John, this is a, a really interesting piece. And then he gave me like 10 things I should have done differently on it because he was like a journalist and an editor by background and everything. He goes, he goes, but John, I think, I think there's something here. Like the world, we in in Seattle area, we see Amazon for what it is, but not many sure. people do. So this is again 2012 right yeah. and he goes i think you ought to write a book about it something i'd never thought but hey there's a signal right there's the market sure. telling me something so i wrote a book called the amazon way which is a a a, a bestseller has over 1500 customer reviews at amazon it's it it's been this loved book about the leadership principles i then like and so then these opportunities to start speaking um started to come up and I kept repeatedly getting a question that was like the form of like, well, how would Jeff think about this? What would Amazon do in this circumstance and everything? So I wrote a book called Think Like Amazon, 50 and a half ideas to become a digital leader. And that's like the full playbook. So those two books are compliments. And then Big Bet Leadership came from the work I was doing at T-Mobile in taking all these concepts from Amazon, but delicately creating mechanisms and a playbook for new business incubation at T-Mobile. And my co-author for Big Bell Leadership, Kevin McCaffrey, was was responsible. He was the directly responsible individual for new business incubation at T-Mobile. And I was lucky enough to talk him into being my co-author for this book. So that's the, the quick story of sure. Amazon and kind of how it inspired me um, to be both a world-class operator and an explorer, an innovator, right? And that's what I think companies that are successful, they start losing is they start losing that exploratory capability that you have as a true entrepreneur. And sure. and so that that's where this counterbalance of being both a world-class operator and an explorer and an innovator is necessary in most companies. Wow, that's awesome. And I think that innovation is is mis is misconstrued i'm gonna say because it feels like if i'm not on the cutting edge of technology yeah. it's not gonna work right so yeah. um and, we're gonna, and it comes yeah, it comes back to where you yeah. you started this conversation which is look at the hard problems in your business right why do customers leave us what's our customer acquisition cost what's our cost per unit or cost per serve why isn't why aren't my csat scores way better than than average why are things trending down why am i why am i skiing uphill all the time right those are the things to to think through and those require innovation to fundamentally change those so people think of it as you were saying like as a technology or a new product yeah. no 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 innovate your operating model that's where you're likely going to get the biggest banger and then think about how to serve new customers, new use cases, new capabilities, but start with your operating model. That's awesome. Hey, we're going to quick take a quick break, John. When we come back, I really want to kind of help the average business owner that isn't in the Amazon and T-Mobile echelon really kind of figure out how to innovate that operating model. So we'll be right back. Awesome. I'm, uh, Honored to be hanging out with John Rossman, managing partner at Rossman Partners. And we've been talking about this innovation. And like we said before the break, I just, that's a word for me that I struggle with because it's, I'm a black and white thinker. So I'm thinking way something super huge. I like the fact that you're talking about, you know, um, operating models. And and so for, a, for an entrepreneur listening, John, that's, you know, $5 million company. 
you know, and they're the kind of company that, you know, they're sometimes they're selling, sometimes they're, you know, doing the work. I mean, they're, you know, wearing all these hats. Innovation tends to be like this. Um, hey, when I'm on vacation and I have an afternoon with nothing to do, I'm going to then think about <laughs> innovation, right? So well, how do you integrate that into your day-to-day -day for that guy or that girl listening? Yeah. So I've worked with a lot of individuals, small teams, small companies, proven companies, but small companies. And Amazon's approach for any problem, situation, proposal, innovation is you write about it, right? So they call it working backwards. It's this narrative-based writing and debating process. And it works for any size company. And I do it just for myself, right? Okay. Any complex situation, if you write it out and then think about it and debate it, you will do it better. And that's true experimentation, but that's the cheapest and fastest experimentation that, that you can do. So in Big Bet Leadership, we frame out some specific techniques, specific templates of how to do this and and we have kind of you know one one is called the 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 what sucks memo. This is like what's the real problem and what really um, problem to it. The the second memo is called the outcome definition memo, also called the WTF memo or what's the future memo. That's where we get into the hypothesis stage of like, well, what would have to be true to solve this problem? What would the killer feature be? The third is the outcome financial memo. Really understanding not just the business case, but the cost drivers behind it and understanding that cost model is an often overlooked and underappreciated aspect of what needs to be experimented. You have to get to unit cost that is not just sustainable, but is an advantage. And then the fourth is kind of the classic from Amazon called the future press release, right? But you can't start with the future press release. You have to do it. But regardless of whether you use the templates we provide or not, writing out your concepts and then trying to exp have somebody else read it without you talking and to understand it, that's how you actually think these things through. And again, you can do that on your fishing boat on the weekend, you know, but you have to pull yourself away from the, from the moment of, of interrupt driven approaches, right? You, you, you know, the concept of, are, are you working in the business or are you working sure. on the business? What I'm right. suggesting is working on the business in a very thoughtful, contemplative, kind of stoic manner, yeah. disconnecting from all the interruptions and really thinking through a situation. And I feel like this is where a third party can help you with that. And that's why I wanted to know if that's what you guys do at Rossman Partners, because if you tell, if, if you analyze you know, if you're a golf swing analyst and you look at Tiger Woods swing, you're going to be able to see a little glitch here or there where he might not see it. Definitely a novice like me. I look at that swing. I think it's beautiful. I'm like, it's fine. And there's a guy going, oh, my gosh, he just did X. And I'm like, what? So is that where you guys at Rossman come in to kind of come alongside people that need that help in understanding their golf swing? It, it, it is. And we try, we, we have a, we have a concept of a, a 10 X power to weight ratio. And what we try to do is provide a service that has the value of 10 X, what a normal consulting uh, process would do. And, and we think we do it with a variety of ways, but at the end of the day, it's by coaching you versus it doing it for you sure. and kind of being that devil's advocate, right? Like we provide both technique, but we're also critical thinkers. And at the end of the day, if I can't understand the concept, like most of the time it's because it's under thought. And so being kind of the, the idiot in the room is a superpower that I provide to my customers because I've seen a lot of businesses, but I'm an expert in none. But if I can't understand your concept that you're proposing, yeah. it, it's it likely isn't ready to proceed in your investment cycle. And so, you know, we kind of do both the coaching on how to do this as well as the independent advisory work of like, you know, I don't get it. Therefore, I think you've got more work to do on this. <laughs> Well, and I'm just wondering, are you working more with new companies with new ideas or existing companies that feel stagnant that need to 
uh, innovate like we talked about uh, before uh, in order uh, to survive uh, all 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 of the the above very very honestly my my favorite opportunities are working with the actual you know operators of a company where where we can make decisions really quickly and do this together and so i do do a lot of work with big enterprises but they have a a cadence and a rhythm that just takes kind of forever. My favorite businesses are proven small businesses who like, oh man, we need we need to compete better than we're competing today. And, yeah. and we can work extremely effective with the executive team in like both thinking through the situation, but we leave behind a lasting framework and lasting skills so that they do this as part of how they think through any future situation. Wow. Have you run into companies that have no framework when you talk oh, about yeah. all, all the time, all, all the time? And, and I just want people that don't have framework to feel a little solace right now, because it's, you know, when you hear these words that you're talking about, it's like can be overwhelming. But but, but, but but the most dangerous thing is is having a framework, but using the wrong framework for the right wrong situation. So here's an example. OKRs. Right. I think I think OKRs are a very good kind of connecting goals and strategy to execution milestone but it is a if p i have seen people try to use okrs for solving hard problems and for setting strategy and that is exactly the wrong framework to use relative to that and so that's where you know you and i were talking about like you gotta have a lot of tools in the toolkit and you gotta yeah. you know right horse for the right course mentality right. and really understand what true strategy is. I, I oftentimes in my keynote, so I do a lot of keynote speaking and I talk about four books that have really fundamentally impacted me. The first is called good strategy, bad strategy. And it truly helps you understand what, what a good strategy versus a bad strategy is and how to do it. And at its heart, it's about problem solving. Um, the second is, um, uh, deep work by Cal Newport. And it's about this, this concept of disconnecting, turning off all the interruptions and, and really focusing on something complex. The third is called switch, how to change when change is hard. And it's, and it's how communication and appealing to both the head and the heart is critical when we're trying to create change uh, within a team or within an organization. And the, and the fourth, and this is always self-serving, but it's the truth, which is Big Bad Leadership, which draws on all of those books and is a very clear playbook on how to do this really hard job, which is actually changing a business. That's what a transformation is. And so those four books, you know, I think reading is an absolute mandatory job to be done sure. if you yeah. want to if you really want to run a great business and if you really want to be the leader that you're posing yourself to if you don't have a healthy appetite of taking in meaty content not blog posts but meaty content like your podcast and thinking through these things like you're not doing your job as a leader well and i think that that again is seems to be an elective course, right? Reading and learning, because a lot of us think that we were born with it. I always, you know, we do leadership training. People are like, "Am I born with the tools or not?" And I'm like, "Well, were you born with a hammer? We, no, you weren't, right? I mean, you, you now you need to learn how to use it." whatever they are, you know, you don't just get big bet leadership, you have to learn how to use it. And again, same with the funny thing is you could buy the book and sit it on your shelf and it will not do you a bit of good, right? So, right. you know, and, I've and, seen that too. And so we kept the book pretty, pretty, pretty thin. It's very readable, but yeah. you get a set of templates. So big bet journal, a uh, pre-flight checklist, uh, Big Bet GPT, a set of prompts for free at BigBetLeadership.com to help take the book and put it into action. And so this whole book is about transitioning to action. And anytime I send a book to somebody with a note, the note always says, I hope you put this book to work. This book was written to be used, not right. just to be learned from. And so we really designed the whole experience to be one that transitions into execution not for everything, but for these sure. these leadership moments that are about big change. Yeah. 
Well, and that's part of your offering today is if you go to bigbetleadership.com, you can get your Big Bet Journal. You can get the Big Bet free flight checklist and then access to the Big Bet GBT. And you get a copy of the Amazon Way Leadership poster. So yeah, that's right. That's yeah. pretty that's pretty cool. So thanks for thanks for that today. Absolutely. Um, you know, again, there's so much here. How, how do you how do you simplify this? Because I I try to pair it down purely for myself, not my listener, but for myself. I'm like, how do I, you know, like pair this down to like sixth grade education that I can learn something today and walk away and implement something right away tomorrow? So let's do two things. A, what's the what's the real problem in your business? Like where are you not competitive today, right? And two, let's write a memo about that. First part of the memo is the problem. And the second part of the memo is what's your hypothesis? What's your, what's your guess as to how you would solve that problem? So let's do those two things and you're starting the process. So where are you not competitive? So again, now, is this something here, John, where you would be best off asking your team and your customers if you're coming up with a blank um, sheet of paper, so to speak? Well, I, I, I think talking to your team and your customers, you can never, you can never go wrong. But at the end of the day, you got to, you got to, you're looking for clues, not the answer, right? Okay. And, and, and so, um, that's the thing I would be careful about is, well, my customer said, this is the problem. It, sometimes that's a symptom. Sometimes that they have an incentive behind what they tell you. It, that's why surveys are helpful, but are not the answer on all of this sort of stuff. And so, again, I tend to think of it as you're getting a scent, you're getting a clue, you're not getting the answer as to either what the real problem is or what the real customer need is, or what the answer is going to be. You're going to, you're going to get clues. Sure. Oh, that's awesome. And and that's, so, and that's the, that's the art. The art uh, is really understanding what's my customer really looking for, or what's the real problem in my business at the root cause level. And then what is the real fix for that customer opportunity for that problem? That, that, that's the art right there. Yeah. And, and if you're listening today and you're struggling with that, that's why Rossman Partners is here to be able to, you know, help you. I Again, I call them blind spots because there are certain spots in our car that we can't see even with mirrors. So if you think you don't have any blind spots in your business, you know, I've yet to run into a business that doesn't have them. And they can range from, hey, this is the way we've always done business around here. My grandpa did it this way. My dad did it this way. I'm going to do it this way. You know, from that all the way to, you know what, my customer experience is fine. I don't need to work on that. I mean, those are two big blind spots that we see a lot. And so that's what Rossman's here to help you with is to see that blind spot. And I just, like again, I think of it as a golf swing coach man nothing easier than some guy or girl looking at your swing going hey if you just do this the ball goes 20 yards farther and it was like man why didn't someone tell me this in college right but the reality is is that there's been you know you can't teach somebody everything and that's why i'd like your continuous learning piece so um what what is rossman what, what do you focus on first when you're when you're dealing with somebody do you ask that question of like what's not working in your business? Do you just jump in and start right at that spot? It, 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 it depends. Um, but sometimes that is it. But off, more often than not, what happens is, like, well, we have an initiative underway. And would you come in and help us, you know, pressure test or review the situation? And so they, they, they are already underway and like, hey, here's a transformation. Here's a innovation program or here's a problem that we're solving and we're underway on it would you help us be successful at this and and then i start at the beginning and guess what questions i go and ask i'll, I'll go and do interviews with all the key players right in, both internally and externally and i'll yeah. ask essentially two simple questions what problem are we solving with this initiative and what's our hypothesis for what the future state is going to be like what's the solution and you would think that these people never talked before because I will not get just 
variations of the same answer. I will get distinctly <laughs> like out of the universe, <laughs> different answers sure. to those very yeah. basic questions. What problem are we solving and what's our hypothesis for the future state? And yeah. that's where we start to go, oh gosh, I, it, and, and that's why these things slow down and, and, um, and why the failure rate is so high is because yeah. we think we're working on the same thing. We think we're working together, but actually we're, we're, we're passing each other by all the time. And this writing and communicating and debating is the solution that helps part of the solution It's the first step towards sure. being successful at these. In the book, we write about Big Bet Legends and there's three habits that Big Bet Legends have. They create clarity. One, We've been mostly talking about creating clarity. Second thing they do is they maintain velocity. They don't just start off with good intentions. They follow through on making it a priority. And the third thing they do, and this is the hardest one, is, is they pull forward risk and value creation deferring as many other commitments and expenses as possible. And so they kind of flip the script on how you proceed on these things. That's what you do, but it all starts with that creating clarity. Wow. And without that clarity and the velocity, I don't think there, you can pull forward, right? I mean, you That's need right. those two in order to get that third one. You're and absolutely right. kind of just try to say, hey, hey, I don't have time for the clarity, John. I don't have time for the velocity. Let's just pull forward. You we, get we're that just, we're lot? just, we're just building. We, you know, we, we, we picked this path and we're just going with it. And, yeah. you know, in a year from now, we'll see how it works. And, you know, they yeah. just kick the can down the road all the time. But guess what? Those are actually, to some degree, the positive cases because at least they're recognizing a change is needed and they're doing something about it. Yeah. All of these fail, failure statistics, what they don't recognize is the errors of omission, where a transformation was needed and and leadership didn't take a bold move to, to solving sure. these, these issues, right? So every wow. time you see a great business go to average or an average business go to unsustainable, well, th that's a failure of leadership in recognizing a problem in their business and doing something about it. Boy, I tell you, that is crazy how many leaders blame everybody but themselves. Oh, exactly. Yeah. It's the weather. It's the competitor. It, it's, it's the competition. It's, the it's, team, it's, it's Amazon. It's yeah. the government. It's, you know, the exactly. Chinese. It's it's yeah. everything other than them, right? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, and, as, and, as, as, I, as, as I wrote in Think Like Amazon, I, I, I had a couple lines in there that that people really like. And, and the line is complaining is not a strategy, right? I get people complaining yeah. to me all the time about Amazon and competing against Amazon. And, and I just go, I go, great, but like, that's not what I do. I solve problems. So if you want to talk yeah. about how we, how we, how we work to compete against Amazon, call me. I, I love, but if, if we're just going to yeah. sit here and complain about the current state, like yeah. I, I really have zero patience for that. <laughs> Well, John Gordon wrote a great book called The No Complaining Rule. And he said, you can, you can complain about anything you want as long as you have a solution in your right. mind. So again, if I'm going to say, woe is me on this, Amazon's eating my lunch, I am okay with that as long as there is a strategy then how following. are you going to compete and there there exactly. are uh, i i will take i will make a bet to anybody if you bring me a situation i will i will figure out a way that you can compete against it now it won't be easy medicine oftentimes but there is a way to compete against any situation well, come on we want to take one pill and be fixed in about eight minutes so you got eight minutes john so so uh, one last question, and I'm going to let you go as we land the plane today. Um, tip of the day for somebody listening. Maybe it's something that we covered you want to reiterate. Maybe it's something that we haven't shared yet. But what would your tip of the day be for somebody well, the, 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 This is either going to be the most boring tip of the day you've ever had <laughs> or the most insightful or, or maybe a combination of, of, of both, sure. which is understand your unit costs far better than you understand your unit costs today. And unit costs are the, the beacon that shows you if you're effectively competing relative to your peers. And it's amazing to me how many companies 
don't truly either understand their unit costs or use that as a beacon to drive innovation. So that's that's my, again, boring sure. or tremendously insightful uh, advice for the day. I've already given you four books to go read. Yeah. Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, Deep Work, Switch, How to Change When Change is Hard, and Big Bet Leadership. But that'll be the last one I, I leave on, which is um, your unit costs are the path for innovation. Wow, that's fantastic. So, hey, we could sit all day and do this, John. I want to be respectful of your time. If people listening, if there's somebody right now that really is inspired by what we talked about and they want to learn more about you, they want to connect with you, what's the best way for people to do that? Yeah, so bigbetleadership.com. You can get all these templates. You can also get in touch with, with myself and Kevin McCaffrey. LinkedIn, John Rossman is also another easy way to get in touch with me. Awesome. That is so cool. And again, I tell you guys every week, rather than jump into your next podcast or rather than jump into your next activity, take a minute and just ponder what John talked about. Because if you don't walk away with one or two things, you know what, that's on you. He did a great job of laying out so much, whether it's clarity, velocity, pull forward, talking about competition and how to, you know, deal with that. Um, you know, unit costs, there's so much here. So again, listen to it again, if you need to, whatever, grab a copy of big that leadership, but make sure that you leave this better than you came. If that happens, then John and I did our job today. And John, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I uh, can't wait to read your book and continue to learn from you. Amen, man. You What a great wrap up. Thank you for having me.